Who owns a piece of history? Is it the person who finds it? The museum that restores and preserves it? The country that said museum belongs to? Or the country where the artifact was first found? If you have answered any of these with yes, then congratulations! You have officially become part of the Great, Great Museum, museum Decolonization Discourse. Uh, the Great Museum what now? Perhaps I should explain with something everyone is familiar with and can relate to these days. Superhero movies. Because wherever you go, there's no escaping them. In 2018's Black Panther, supervillain Eric Killmonger surveys the African collection at the so-called Museum of Great Britain. When he inquires about an axe, he says to the museum's curator, It was taken by British soldiers in Benin, but it's from Wakanda. Don't trip, I'm gonna take it off your hands for you. To which the curator replies, These items aren't for sale. To which Killmonger says, How do you think your ancestors got these? Do you think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? This scene raises several points, not just with the audience, but within the museum's field as well. Not the least of which is... What are you doing bringing a coffee cup into a gallery? That is a serious art hazard, lady. Uh, more importantly though, are the points that... A great deal of African artifacts were taken from their home countries under suspicious circumstances. Many museums may be lacking senior staff with diverse backgrounds, and various ethnic backgrounds are less represented in museums, possibly resulting in a Western perspective on the exhibition's narrative. You may agree with these points or not, but it's undeniable that there are some serious issues that have arisen in the world of museums that, in this very short scene from Black Panther, are being laid bare to the audience. Unfortunately, the rest of Black Panther isn't about T'Challa fighting museum injustices and solving the problems of artifact repatriation around the world, so the question is lost in the rest of the narrative. If T'Challa won't tackle this issue though, I will. So what exactly is the deal with this whole repatriation thing? An example. It's the late 19th century. Two Danish gentlemen are visiting England when they come across Stonehenge. Jævla, det er nogle dejlige klipper. They say as they proceed to make plans to take some of the stones with them, because pretty. D d don't ask about the logistics, just just draw with it. Once in Denmark, the stones are put on display in a safe environment and are kept for research purposes. A century later, the British government suddenly contacts the Danish. Excuse me, Denmark, may we have our stones back? Hmm, nej. Vi kan tage os bedre af dem. What proceeds is a conflict of interest between the Danish and British government. Who has the right to the stones? Is it the Danish for looking after them this long and having researched them into detail, with the claim that they have a better know-how on how to care for the stones? Or the British, who can be perceived as the cultural owners of the stones, despite not having cared for them for over a century and perhaps not having the same facilities to look after them that the Danish do have? It's a crazy example, but it's a similarly crazy thing to imagine that the Stonehenge stones wouldn't be located near Salisbury in England. It would be unheard of, Stonehenge is England, right? Even so, the same could be said for many of the thousands of cultural objects that were brought from former colonies under often questionable circumstances. With these former colonies each becoming more culturally and historically conscious, it stands to reason that they want their cultural heritage back. There are countless examples. Concerned objects range from vast collections of masks and other ceremonial items to incredibly culturally significant masterpieces such as the famous Parthenon marbles or the Elgin marbles if you want to be particularly controversial, uh, the bust of Nefertiti, the Benin bronzes, Priam's treasure, and so on. Having said that, some museums are aware that their collections have an uncomfortable history that was accompanied by colonial violence. Nevertheless, the British's official policy, for example, is not to return the property. Former Prime Minister David Cameron once said about the famous Greek Parthenon marbles and the Indian Koh i Noor diamond that he does not consider returnism to be wise and that if you say yes to one, you suddenly find the British Museum would be empty. I am afraid to say, it is going to have to stay put. The argument against so-called returnism is the same as the argument that museums use for their right to exist, 
They preserve the cultural and natural heritage of people. That seems like a good and well-intended argument, but it essentially means that Ethiopians or the people of India and Greece are apparently unable to preserve their own cultural heritage. The call to return properties to the country of origin is therefore becoming louder and louder. A just as serious problem is that the collections maintain stereotyped images that Europeans had, and still have, about Africans. The thousands of objects in museums are not accompanied by their original history. They are an organized selection of objects, identified and described by Europeans. The power to select, name and decide on the meaning of these items makes Europeans the authors of African history. According to some, repatriation seems to be the only way to rectify the historical injustice that museums have caused. This is a crucial step in order to turn Africans into the guardians of their own history. But let's take a step back. How do Europeans come to be in the possession of these items in the first place? So-called tainted colonial cultural objects are most often war booty, confiscated by missionaries and other such emissaries, exchanged as cultural gifts, as tokens of enforced loyalty, or were stolen or smuggled. The removal of such cultural heritage already took place as early as the first period of European colonialism. Old Aztec texts describe the robberies that Spaniards held since 1492, but their leaders also offered some gifts themselves. That's another thing. Some of these objects were simply bought by colonizers as part of business transactions. However, a large majority of these items arrived in Europe as part of spoils of war or following forced conversions. Bringing back cultural and historical artifacts became particularly popular during the 19th century. As academic interest in the nature and history of mankind grew, historical artifacts found in the many colonized countries became an attractive commodity not only for soldiers looking to make a quick buck and looting objects and selling them back home, but cultural anthropologists and archaeologists as well. This all took place during both war and peace times. It was justified as a good deed. The preservation of knowledge that is in danger of disappearing. Heck, some of these were taken under, for the time, pretty legitimate means. That is, they were uncovered and exhumed from the earth by the researchers themselves and taken back to their motherland in order to further research and take care of them. It's the Indiana Jones method. You find something no one uses anyway and you take it because it belongs in a museum. Except nowadays Indiana Jones would be prosecuted for theft of property because whatever you find belongs to the owner of the land that property is located on. So much for those of us who had aspirations of becoming a modern day Indiana Jones themselves. And so we had legions of researchers, diplomats, missionaries and soldiers alike taking historical and cultural objects from their place of origin to their own country on the other side of the globe. There wasn't much of a regulation going on here, it was a cultural battle royale, an archaeological free-for-all. That wasn't the case for stolen historical goods within European nations though. After the defeat of Napoleon, the European countries began to arrange the return of spoils of war. There were some rules written up, but that did not apply to any colonial possessions. For example, from 1840 onwards, you were not allowed to take old statues and other items of cultural value from the Dutch East Indies with you, but those rules protected the interest of the colonizer. Meanwhile, works of art stolen by the Nazis during the Second World War were subject to strict measures of law ever since the fall of the Third Reich and were widely repatriated to their original owners or at least locations. So, people certainly were aware of the significance of cultural and historical objects respect to their country of origin, just so long as they were European objects. Call it a gentleman's agreement. Especially ever since the decolonization of many former colonies throughout the 1950s, requests regarding the return or repatriation of such cultural objects became more and more common. Rarely, if ever, were they honored though. After all, if the hypothetical scenario in which all colonial objects are returned to their country of origin comes true, then European museums will lose significant parts of their collections and some museums will even lose their entire meaning. There's entire collections and even museums dedicated to this kind of stuff. As such, many of the most renowned museums adhere to the so-called Declaration on the Importance and Value of Universal Museums, 
the stance here is respect the law as it stands, not as it could stand, avoid the slippery slope to depletion to which any concessions potentially leads, acknowledge the wide range of circumstances in which objects were acquired rather than generalizing from the most egregious cases, remember the importance of stewardship and ensure at all costs that objects are safe from conservational lapses or theft, Keep objects where they can be seen in the broadest global and historical context. Do not forget that the dual political entities requesting their return are rarely the entities from which they were taken. And look for imaginative alternatives to permanent restitution, such as curatorial exchanges and long-term loans. Long story short, these museums recognize that, yeah, some of these objects are taken from their place of origin, sometimes under questionable circumstances. But as custodians of set objects for decades if not centuries, and as exhibitor in a location where set objects are visible for all people of the world to behold freely, they reserve the right to hold on to these items. That's definitely not an answer that an African museum that would primarily be subjected to display contemporary African art because 90% of the African cultural and historical objects are located in a country far away would want to hear. It's a status quo that, no matter how you twist it, will always favor a present owner. And if it doesn't, national laws and politics usually had their back as well. But then this happened. Speaking in it's this place. In Burkina Faso, on the 28th of November 2017, French President Emmanuel Macron vowed that France would no longer attempt to meddle in local politics, reversing a long history of intervention known as France Afrique. But in addition to that, also made statements that much of the cultural heritage from several African countries being in France was unacceptable. He stated that finding ways to return these items temporarily or permanently must become a new priority in his country's policy. For the first time ever, a European leader made unequivocal statements regarding the status quo. As a head of state rather than museum director, he effectively undercut arguments against restitution that rely primarily on the protection of legislation. It was a sudden leap forward in a world that had become stagnant for decades. The press went nuts, expecting a Wild West scenario of countries flocking to their former colonizers to reclaim their rightful heritage all over again. Legislators panicked as concerned diaspora organizations, scholars and prominent citizens banded together and requested national leaders of other European countries to disclose their position on Macron's announcement. International conferences were called for in hopes of setting up international agreements and guidelines for the widespread restitution of all cultural heritage. Meanwhile, Macron commissioned a report to be written by Felwin Saar and Benedict Savoy named Restitution of African Cultural Heritage Toward a New Relational Ethics. According to the authors, colonization is a crime against humanity and thus the objects that have been hijacked are illegally held by museums. Saar and Savoy emphasized that the restitution of art can be used to build equal cultural relations of the future instead, and they see restoration as part of the future universalism in which Africa is involved. Their proposed measures include joint research and training by the participating museums, the exchange of temporary exhibitions, as well as the material support for appropriate networks or infrastructures for the museums in Africa. Not everyone was that enthusiastic, however. For one, the museums certainly weren't, because their entire livelihood depends on the showcasing of these historical artifacts. Julien Volper of the Royal Museum for Central Africa in Tervuren expressed an appeal in the French Le Figaro to defend such collections against the enemy in Africa and Europe, trying to turn museums in Europe into a graveyard by emptying them. In his view, the claim arose from biased ideas about European guilt regarding their allegedly racist and reactionary past. In Keeping Their Marbles, British cultural sociologist Tiffany Jenkins argues that Western museums, because of their cosmopolitan role, may hold on to looted art treasures such as the marble statues from Athens discussed in her book. Giving back would be historically incorrect and socially undesirable. All in all, tensions rose as conflicting parties each had their own interests to protect and conventions and reports alike were set up to discuss the importance and credibility of repatriation.
But Hipstorian, I hear you cry out as you hear all these promises of additional research and possible reforms. That's a lot of promises, but what does it mean? Other than a bunch of academics discussing the meaning and consequences of colonialism in modern-day museums, uh, probably not much. It's now two years after the Sarsavoy report, and as it turns out, not a single item has been returned to Africa as of yet, and the movement appears to have lost much of its momentum. Neither the 26 pieces from Benin nor any of the other 19,000 other sub-Saharan artifacts in French museums have been returned, and despite Macron's promise of a major public conference on the issue, nothing has transpired apart from two closed-door seminars. As it turns out, it's impossible to implement rules about returning what's, at present, privately owned properly without making some serious changes to French law. Uh, who would have thought? Public museums in France are deemed inalienable by law, meaning that not a single object can be permanently removed without necessitating a change in legislation. So what basically started as a passionate sermon to defend the injustices of the world and a promise to bring balance to the force ended in a wet echoing fart. Despite this lack of movement in France though, several exchanges of cultural objects have taken place in other countries, albeit on a smaller scale, on a per-item basis. None of these examples would have been possible without extensive negotiation, research, personnel, resources and cooperations between the various parties involved, however, as there was no uniform procedure or rulebook. Even so, each return was, ultimately, a success. Lacking any current policy to guide them, these were incremental restitutions. Meanwhile, the Dutch Museum of World Cultures has simply put together its own guidelines on returns, neatly facilitating claims around three categories of collection items. Those removed unlawfully, those removed without consent, and those whose cultural value for their country of origin outweighs their value to Dutch culture. As it turns out, the real movement may not be in France after all, but in places like Germany and the Netherlands, as well as the European Union as a whole, and in settler countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the US. That does remain an important lesson in the report, though it may not be one intended by its authors. Sweeping attempts at restitutions are almost never workable. Instead, the more nuanced, piecemeal approaches offer a more realistic way forward. So then, where to next? It's obvious that the museums themselves are far from enthusiastic to relinquish their entire collection. Museums thrive on the interest that their objects generate amongst visitors, so relinquish all of the objects and you don't have much of a museum left to make a living off of. And yet, the counterwork is there. The Washington Conference Principles deals with exactly these kind of issues, except it focuses on stolen Nazi art in the Second World War. One could argue that the same rules could be applied to colonial objects. The problem, however, is the implementation. How are you going to ask all of these museums to relinquish some of their top pieces? And should they even be asked to relinquish their top pieces? Let's face it, Greece would be a perfectly safe place for the Parthenon marbles. But what about countries like Libya, Iraq, Syria or Afghanistan? The safety of the objects is understandably a major part of the return negotiations. If that cannot be guaranteed, a solution must be found. Because you'd be crazy to give things back if you'd know they would be gone the next day or will be at risk of being destroyed. Congolian interest groups understand full well that they first need to ensure adequate depots and safe museums. But they could already focus on future resolutions and mutual consultations. Killmonger was a terrorist. An overly fanatical, cold-blooded killer who, were he to have his way, would gladly commit some kind of genocide across the globe. But gosh darn it, did he have a point. Maybe a museum should reconsider the way they curate their collections. The purpose of a museum isn't just to display and research, it's to educate. To tell the story of the object's creators and to place their narrative in the right context. The decolonization of collections may sound like a very loaded term, but it can be as simple as co-curating collections and telling the story beyond the Western perspective, so that its descendants can let their story be heard as well. At the very least, run a museum, not a jewelry store. 
Yes, these objects are beautiful and fascinating to look at, but it's important to keep in mind the stories that lie behind them. Honor not the person who took this object from its country of origin, but the person who created it in the first place. Awareness in itself might not bring justice back to the world, but it will at the very least help people realize that… the person whose name is given to the Parthenon marbles? Yeah, he kinda demolished that ancient art in order to ship it back to his home country to be displayed as perfectly legitimate theft. Let's face it, a 20 minute video gushing over Killmonger's terrorist pectoral… Uh, principles won't solve a century long issue. There's still a long road ahead for museums to figure out the issue of decolonization and restitution of collections before both parties will come out with a satisfying conclusion. Restitution is just one part of a much larger story though. The next time you visit a museum, lay your eyes on a priceless historical artifact and read its description, perhaps question how that object might have gotten there. Who made it and what cultural significance does it have not just in the past but in the present as well? And is this the right place and context to show it in? The museum staff is right there, I'm sure they'll gladly have a chat with you. Just don't go poisoning any curator's coffee cups. Just tell them that drinking coffee or any other kind of beverage is totally forbidden instead.